Hello everyone and welcome to the weekly Mind of Bleep webinars. Um, welcome to the medical series and today we're going to talk to you about chest x-rays and we're joined by Dr. Laura and Dr. Wendy who are going to tell you all about demystifying chest x-rays. Um, and please, if you have any questions at all, post them in the comment section and we will try to answer those in the end during the Q&A session. And if you happen to have any questions after um, after the webinar, please feel free to, to get in touch with us via Facebook or via Mind the Bleep website. Um, the session is going to be recorded and at the end, we're going to post a feedback link. After you fill in the feedback form, which we will really appreciate, we're going to um, make the recorded materials available to you and you can access them at any time. And if you wanna sign up for the future webinars, I'm going to post the link in the comment sections in a second. Um, so without further, further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Dr. Laura to um, deliver the session. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, so yes, I'm a radiology resident over in Liverpool and I was asked to do this session. I think it's actually a really good idea because they are, I think everyone thinks they can look at a chest x-ray, but then when you start learning, you properly start like, you know, training about them, you actually realise how difficult they are. <laughs> so I thought we'll go right, strip it right back to basics because that really does help. So I think that is what we shall do. So we can start now. Um, so yeah, we'll just look at chest x-rays today. Why is this not letting me? Oh, there we go. So first of all, I thought, what do you guys want to get out of the session? Uh, if there's anything specific you'd like to get out of the post in the comments, that'd be brilliant. Um, I know Wendy's going to keep an eye on the comments for me, and then she'll interrupt me at any point if anyone asks anything or anything like that. If it's something really specific to like an image, then you know, post and when you stop me. And if it's something general, then we can answer at the end. Okay. So I kind of looked at these. So I thought, how to generate an X-ray? It's certainly something we have to learn as registrars for our exams. But I don't really recall much about it in medical school at all. Um, so I thought maybe we could look at that really quickly. Um, the key to radiology and any imaging interpretation is normal anatomy. You don't know what's abnormal, so you know what's normal. Sounds stupid, but believe me, when you're looking at a 2D picture of a 3D object, things can get a little bit difficult. How to approach a plain film. Um, X-rays are plain films, interchangeable words. So I remember when I was doing war trans and things, when I was a lot, you know, when I was a lot uh, more junior, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, when people asked me to interpret a chest tech from a ward round in front of the consultant, the nurses, the regs, the F1s, F2s, I just used to freak out. So I thought I'll show you how to do it so no one has that freak out situation. General principles of image interpretation uh, is really important. So you can use that for any imaging modality at all. I, look, I do an ABCDE approach. You can have whatever approach you like, as long as you stick with it. That's the main thing. You've got to, you've got to be quite um, rigid. And then the review areas. Every imaging modality has a review area. It's where, it's where we miss things and where pathology can hide. OK, so that's what I thought. Anything you want to add, pop it in the comments. How do we get one? How do we get an X-ray? We just want an X-ray. We get it like that, don't we? How do we make one? So this is kind of pretty much most x-ray images uh, machines so the patient stands in front of the detector so there's a film inside the square just in front of the patient that that captures the image they used to be physical films like pieces of paper like pieces of ph like photographic paper almost now they're all digital and then the little small aperture behind the patient that you can see the little smaller square that is the um x-ray beam that's where the actual x-rays come from so the radioactive material all that stuff is all within that, that square okay we prefer the patients to be standing this way and i'll explain that to you in a second um but obviously as i'm sure you've seen when patients are very sick overnight or in the middle of the day or they're too sick to stand up like that then we can do it the way around so we'll go through that as well. So within the little square behind the patient, um, this is going on. So this is the x-ray tube, okay? 
so the there's a there's a positive side and negative side remember an x-ray is generated by a very 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 highly charged beam of electrons as you can all remember from your a levels as long as they might have been a while ago we still got to remember them and um, they are negatively charged particles okay they are negatively charged particles and the little curly thing on the left hand side of the image that is a filament so we apply a really high electric bolt through the filament to release a load of electrons so they're all sitting there negatively charged together we then apply a current across the whole x-ray tube to accelerate the electrons towards the orange thing the orange thing is called the target so that's made out of metal basically like a tungsten usually we use and in hitting the and when the electrons hit the target x-rays are released basically and that is how you make an x that's how you get an x-ray they then come they are directed downwards or any direction really, however your tube's facing, usually it's downwards, um, towards your patient. And then it, they, the x-rays go through the patient and they're absorbed. So different structures in the body, different tissues, so bones, lungs, soft tissues, muscles, they all absorb different amounts of x-rays. And then that is then projected onto the film in front of the patient, the patient with a, Ideally, we want the patient to hold the film, like they literally cuddle the film. That moves the shoulder blades out of the way so we can fire as many electrons, uh, as many x-rays, sorry, through the lungs as possible. And that is how you make an x-ray in a very uh, quick, basic way. So, oh, it's not projected very well, sorry. But um, yeah, basically x-rays are just all black and white. It's a grayscale. Um, Unfortunately, everything in my life is now black and white. And so black is air. So x-rays go straight through air. They're not attenuated, we call it. They're not absorbed by air. They go straight through. So they come, they look black. Fat absorbs a little bit more. So it absorbs a bit. So you get like a, like a dark gray color. Um, light gray, it's a soft tissue. It's hard to tell. It could be muscle, could be ligament. It's difficult to tell, really. Um, pretty white is going to be bone. So in a chest x-ray, for instance, very, very white is going to be bone, you know, like your skeleton. And then if it's extremely white, almost blinding compared to the black, it's going to be metal or some something foreign body, basically. The most, so the most attenuating natural thing is bone. Okay. So that's kind of how we interpret all images, really. Um, remember I said about how the patient should stand in front of the tube. So they should basically cud cuddle the detector, okay? That means that we can get an accurate size of the heart. So we call them PA and AP. So it's um, posterior anterior. So the x-rays are going from the posterior aspect of the patient to the anterior aspect of the patient. So they're going right the way through from the back to the front. An AP projection is the opposite way around. That's done if the patient is unwell, or they're not very mobile, or they're just so, so sick. We need a picture, whether it be a good, good quality or bad quality, really. That means, unfortunately, the heart is closer to the x-ray tube. And the way x-rays work is they go, they come out in a, in a line, but they diverge. So that means in an AP projection, we can't tell how big the heart is. It can look massive and actually be normal. And it's all to do, it's all to do with an artifact of the x-ray production, basically. So you have to take that with a pinch of salt. Every x-ray should have on it um, a side marker because, you know, normally we can tell what's the left and what's the right because of where the heart is. But sometimes people's hearts on the wrong side, dextrocardia. So we often, well, we always have to put a side marker on and they will always tell you what projection the film is in as well, whether it's a PA or an AP. Okay. I'm gonna show you some examples now. So this is on the left-hand side of the screen is a PA, that is a normal chest. That's what we want. We want a normal PA. So this one, as you can see, the patient is, you can see all the lungs beautifully, they're nice and aerated, the scapula are way out of the way. You can't, they're not really projecting through the, through the hemithorax at all. And the heart is a nice normal size. On the AP film, 
you can't really see all the lungs properly because the scapula are in the way. And we're also looking at the heart. It looks absolutely ginormous. And I bet you it's normal, to be honest, but it looks massive because of the divergence of the x-rays. It creates a bigger shadow. So bear that in mind when you're looking at chest x-rays. Always have a little look at if it's PA or AP. Normal anatomy. Unfortunately, I can't go through all the anatomy in the chest. We'll be here till next week. But a few important things to look out for on x-rays, particularly on chest x-rays. Um, we call it the silhouette sign. So in order for us to see what's going on inside the body with x-rays, we need, we need a contrast. So we need difference in tissue density between two objects. So we use the normal anatomy to compare. So for instance, we look at the, the left ventricle wall there. So it's really nice. It's really nice and delineated. It's a nice big thick muscle with blood inside it. And it's sitting in front of an aerated lung. That's how we can see where the heart is compared to lungs. If someone's got a chest infection, they've got some consolidation in the left, in the left lingula, so that's the left lobe that covers that covers the left ventricle, that we lose that nice crisp look, the nice crisp line between the, 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 the higher density heart and the lower density lungs. So things are like, like I say, normal and anatomy is very important for stuff like that. So if we go down the center, can you see my, uh, I hope you can see my, um, what do you call it, my cursor? And uh, if not, apologies. But the center of the screen, center of the image, sorry, we can see the trachea. You see the windpipe going down there. And then you can see the bifurcation. The bifurcation remember is called the carina. Um, the right main bronchus, is more vertical and it's slightly shorter than the left main bronchus. The left main bronchus kind of sweeps up a little bit. Uh, we can see the aortic knuckle, that's where the aortic arch arches down, arches round on itself and comes down. That's a very important anatomical landmark, landmark for us because it can indicate pathology. And then we see the pulmonary trunk coming through on the left hand side, just kind of just near where that left main bronchus is coming off. Um, in between the aortic knuckle and the pulmonary trunk is called the AP window. Now that's quite, I remember that it was in my finals actually, I remember a question on this. If there's something obscuring the AP window, it's usually hyalur lymphadenopathy. So that's a little nugget you can kind of remember. So that is where it should be. You should see a nice aortic bump and then a pulmonary trunk bump, you shouldn't see anything. That shouldn't be rounded, basically. It should be like, like this, like, like a backwards three almost. Um, obviously you've got your left bend, your left side of the heart there. You've got your right side of the heart on the other side. Uh, you've got pulmonary arteries coming on the right and the left-hand side. Um, we can see the spinous processes quite well on this one. Um, the paratracheal stripe we look for quite a lot, actually, to indicate pathology in the anterior mediastinum. And the paraspinal line, to be honest, I can't remember off, off the top of my head what pathology that is, but basically, normal anatomy is quite important, okay? Obviously, we've then got the ribs, we've got the clavicle, um, and we've got the spine, the spinous pedicles as well. They're the little round things you can see on each side of the vertebral bodies. Okay, so, just... Uh, absolutely beautiful chest x-ray I wanted to show you because it's probably a nice one I've ever seen. I wanted just to show you, if you look at the clavicles and look above each clavicle, it looks like there's almost two bones there, there's two shadows. It's really difficult to tell. What is the edge of the clavicle and what is this weird shadow? What is it? Have they got four clavicles? No, that is called a companion shadow very common, we see it all the time. It's to do with um, the x-ray production, but it's extremely common and don't, it's the kind of thing that a more senior like Reg or a consultant will say to you, oh, what's this? And you go, if you can say, oh, it's a companion shadow, I think they'll probably fall over to be honest. But yeah, that's what that is. Um, I wanted to show you as well, the spinous processes down the center of the spine are absolutely beautiful. Um, if you look at the left main bronchus, you can see it arching very nicely. And you can also see the, um, the pulmonary arteries, and pulmonary vessels. And on the right hand side, uh, it's slightly more difficult to make out. But you can see the right main bronchus is 
more vertical and it's shorter than the left. You've got your hemidiaphragm. So each side of the diaphragm is a hemidiaphragm. You've got a beautiful, um, what we call costophrenic angle, costo being ribs, phrenic being diaphragm. We look down here for um, fluid, so effusions or hemothorax, anything like that. Um, and, and we have the costo, uh, no, okay. sorry, the cardiophrenic angle, which is the angle between the heart and the diaphragm. Okay? So, Really, really nice x-ray. You're probably not going to get a better one than that ever. Now, interpretation. Thank God we don't need to look at films like this anymore because, no, <laughs> they're really hard. Plain chest x-rays. This is the kind of thing I want you to think about when you when you asked to say, when, you, when someone says to you, what does that chest x-ray show? Don't just jump in and go, oh, consolidation, because it's just such an easy thing to like, get your head into. First of all, patient details. Every x-ray should have the patient details in the top left or the top right. So just say, this is a plain chest x-ray of Fred Bloggs, a 52-year-old man, okay? Uh, the date and time of the examination will be on there. Now, that's actually quite important. It sounds really silly, but it's really important because... If someone shows you a chest x-ray from literally the middle of the night, it's probably because he's sick. Like who gets around, you know, you're not going to get a GP refer a patient for an x-ray for a chronic cough and the turn up at three o'clock in the morning. That's not going to happen, is it? So, you know, you look at the time. Is it, is it three o'clock on a Friday or is it three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday? If it's Saturday, they're probably sick. Was part of this, um, part of our assessment when we see sick patients is a chest x-ray. As a rule, I always do one when I see a sick patient because nine times out of ten will be something on the chest. Um, any previous imaging? I my heart sinks when I open a scan and there's no previous imaging, unfortunately. So it really helps us see there's so much going on on there. Like I say, it is a 2D picture of a 3D patient. Things are squished, things are superimposed. Um, so we look for any comparison, basically. If something's been there, if there's, a little, if there's a little nodule in the lung and it's been there for 10 years and not changed, it's probably, probably benign. <laughs> so yeah, and we assess the quality. So again, projection. Is it AP or PA? We want a PA. If the film is at three o'clock in the morning and it's an AP, guarantee that patient's sick and I guarantee they'll be showing it to you for a reason probably got something hideous on the chest okay is it supine or erect we want an erect chest x-ray we want that patient standing up beautifully holding that getting their scapula out the way hugging that detector so that we can see as much aerated lungs as we can we want them to breathe in nicely um is it de departmental or is it mobile you know you can't send a patient who's on death's door to the, the x-ray department because it's skeleton staffed a lot of the radiographers are obviously very well trained, but you know, you've got a lot of sometimes the, you know, the poor porters are like, we're looking after these patients and they're too sick, you can't send them down. They can't, you know, there's nothing worse than a cardiac arrest in the, in the middle of x ray departments, or unfortunately, it does happen. And um, so, we want you know, the mobile film probably sick, and also it makes our interpretation more difficult because unfortunately, they're not as good. So Exposure. So I'll tell you about a little bit about exposure soon. Exposure basically means how much of the x-rays have penetrated through the patient. If I get a film come to me and it's all white, how on earth am I going to make out if there's anything wrong with it? So if it's too bright, not enough x-rays have passed through the patient to the, fil to, to the film or the detector. Um, so, we need to, so we need to increase the exposure factors. If there's, if it's all black, it means far too many x-rays have gone through. We can't quite delineate any tissues. So you need to get, well, that's not, our, you know, that it's, that's the radiographer's job. They're brilliant at it. They can eyeball a patient and they usually say, oh, they're going to need this, that, the other. Um, so exposure is really important. Rotation is massive. I can't hammer home enough. It's a 2D picture of a 3D object. So you think about it. If you rotate even a few degrees to the left or the right, and you literally like that, your heart will look huge. Your mediastinum will look huge, and it looks pathological when it's not. 
So rotation is a massive key, massive thing. I'll show you about that. And inspiratory effort. Some people, you know, they're asked to take a nice deep breath in to really aerate the lungs and, you know, really release the, what you call it, increase distance from the ribs. We can have a good look at everything. But nine out of ten, they don't. They take a little tiny breath in and then they, they exhale by the time the x-ray is taken. So it's difficult. So we look for inspiratory effort as well. Again, if they're really sick, you're not going to get much, much inspiratory effort. So exposure factors. Do we think this is good or do we think this is bad? I'm going to say, oh, not God. I mean, good, not God. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is bad. I, I can't really make out the lung tissue itself. If there's a cancer in there, I'm not going to see it, especially if it's down by the, the periphery of the film. I'm never going to see a small nodule in there. Never, 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 never. We have to report it, but we have to say very poor exposure. Now, what kind of things can contribute to it? Um, like you said, things being people being sick, so really sick patients, um, not breathing properly. This one's not that bad in spiritual effort, actually. It's not too bad. But they're quite big, aren't they? Now, I'm not the slimmest in the world by a, by a long shot, but this patient's quite big. Um, so we need to increase our exposure factors. If the patient's really, really big, got massive body, body habits, so we need to increase our exposure factors. Okay? Now, this one, what do we think about this one? Is anyone commenting, Wendy? Have we got any good, bad in between? Uh, none so far, but usually there's a lag. I'll keep an eye on it. Okay, cool. So this one is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> um, so exposure-wise, we want to be able to see the spinous processes. So they are the pointy bits at the back of the spine. Once, if, if you feel down someone's spine, they're the pointy bits you can feel. Um, it's a little bit, little bit too much down here because I can't quite make them out the whole way down the film. So the very bottom of the thoracic spine there is a little bit too much exposure, but as a rule, it's pretty good. Now this patient, as you can see, she's got very dense breasts. Um, so she's probably, so we don't massively irradiate her. It's probably as good as we're going to get. But we can see the lungs nicely. We can see the bones. I mean, I've it's been chopped off at the side here a little bit, but as a rule, it's a very good exposure. Okay. Now, this one. So, there's something really, really not right with this film. So, if we start, I've cut off all the patient identifications, obviously, if I have to. Um, but you take one look at this film. First thing that springs to me is it's an AP. So, we know it's the wrong way round. So, this has been taken this way. It's mobile, so it's been taken on the ward or in ITU or in A&E where the patient's too sick to go to the department, and it's erect, kind of erect. Is it erect or is it semi-erect? Probably semi-erect, actually. You probably propped this poor fella up and said, take a deep breath in. Um, so, yeah. Um, they also, I check for rotation. So this is an AP film, granted, the heart looks massive, but this is not normal up here, up in the left upper zone, the right upper zone, sorry, I can't put left and right, right, it's not good, is it? In the right upper zone, there's something very abnormal. Now, is this a tumour? Or is this his mediastinum? I think it's mediastinum, because if you look, at his clavicle. So we check for rotation by the clavicles. So we look at the end of each clavicle. So here's the end of the right clavicle. Here's the end of the left clavicle. Now we compare these to the spinous processes. So the spinous process is here. Okay, so it's actually helpfully where this NG tube is wrongfully sighted for the record, but here is where the spinous processes are. So there should be equal distance between the two ends of clavicles and there's not. It's not at all here though. The right is on a different, got a different post to the left. So probably it's rotational because he's also got some left lower zone consolidation down here. But you know, I, I, I can't say this is a tumor. I can't say it's not a tumor. It's very, it makes it very difficult. And I haven't actually a slide on this, but if there are any F1s or F2s on this, that's probably more, more important for you really. 
I remember when I started as a doctor, one of my first jobs ever was to check a chest x-ray for NG tube placement. I've never been taught how to do it. And I nearly had a heart attack. So I remember people saying, you can obviously look up and die if they're in, if they're in the wrong place. But I'll tell you now quickly. Um, the NG tube should go central. Obviously it goes down into office, so it should get down into office. I cannot say this is in the right place because it, I don't think it is actually, I think it's in just this office. If the tube coils up on itself, so you literally see it go woof and you literally coil up at the bottom, that's wrong, that has to be removed. So you have to ring the clinicians and say, take that off. Or, you know, you have to tell the nurses, take that out, don't feed. So the tube has to go, you have to see it go under the left hemidiaphragm and to the left, okay? Unless it's a jejunostomy or something weird and wonderful, that's different. But for normal NG tubes, like that is far too high. You, they can't feed through that because it might not be in the lungs, but it also might be. So you've got to be careful. Okay. So remember, under if it's gone under the left hemidiaphragm and it's sweeping towards the left where the stomach lives, great, go for it. If not, absolutely, it's not worth the risk. I've known, I've, I've known people misinterpret them and patients have been very, very sick. So don't do that. Cool. So check this again, rotation end of clavicles compared to the spinous processes, okay? Inspiration and expiration. We want them to inspire. We want them nice, big lungs. We can see as much lung tissue as possible. We want it to be stretched out. The lungs, I think I read once, if you stretch out each lung, I might be lying, but if you stretch out each lung, you can fill a tennis court or something. Maybe it's both lungs together. Anyway, it's massive. They're huge. Massive surface area. So we want them to be as uh, uh, as airy as we can, so we can see through them. If they're all squished down, we can't really see much. It just looks difficult. Like if you look on the image on the right hand side, um, like all on this left lower zone down here, it almost looks a little bit bunched up, doesn't it, compared to the one on the left hand side? So I wonder whether actually there's not consolidation. It's just because they're not breathing properly. And you can see the difference. You see the in the so look on the right, the left hand side again. If you look at the in the distance between the ribs on the inspiratory inspiratory film, it's massive compared to the expiratory film. And obviously, if we've got ribs in the way, it's difficult to see the lung tissue underneath because we've got the anterior ribs and the posterior ribs superimposed on the lungs, so it makes it difficult. Okay, so nice big deep breath in, snap your shot. Actual assessment of the film, I do A, B, C, D, E. So I say, I look at the airway, I check the breathing, so the lungs, um, the bones, the cardiac issue, like the cardiac bits, the diaphragm and everything else. You can have your own, I think Geeky Medics do a similar one. There's so many of them. Some people go in to out, some people go out to in. Some people have got the most bizarre ways of looking at them. It doesn't matter. You pick yours and you stick with it. You make sure you look at everything. And stick with it okay so airway trachea basically trachea and carina there's not much more you can see to be honest and uh, we look for deviation is it pushed towards something is it pulled towards something why is it deviated what's going on um can you see the carina usually you can if you look hard enough sometimes you can't um the right main bronchus should be more vertical, like I say, should be more vertical and should be sh should be um, uh, shorter than the left main bronchus. That kind of swoops up a little bit. That's why if you've got someone who's inhaled something, probably going to be in the right main bronchus because that's where it goes. I read once about a million years ago that it's all to do with um, it's it, it, it's like a pregnancy thing. Um, so it's like a protective mechanism for pregnancy. So if you're going to inhale something. It's going to more likely go into the right main bronchus than the left main bronchus because remember the the, the the IVC all that stuff sits on the left hand side. So if you've got a lady who's heavily pregnant, the gravid uterus physically squishes the IVC and it can reduce uh, venous return. So I think it was something to do with if they're on the you can tip them to the left and you can grab it out the right main bronchus. I don't know. I read it once. It might be a massive lie again. I hate them. Uh, I look at the hilum as well. I know it's not quite by the airway, but I do look at the hilum. It's right next to the carina. Um, I'm looking for vasculature and lymphatics, basically. If we've got massive lymph nodes, 
it is usually very obvious and we look at that EP window, which is the three in between the aortic knuckle and the uh, pulmonary, the pulmonary uh, vessels on the left-hand side, okay? So if the trachea is pushed away, there's usually something pushing it. So there's usually going to be a pneumothorax, like on the image on the bottom. So on the right-hand side, sorry, the left-hand side of the screen, that trachea is being pushed to the left-hand side. The whole mediastinum is being pushed because if you look carefully, that's a massive tension pneumothorax because the lung tissue is squished down here. That's all lung tissue. And all this mediastinum is being shoved over to the left-hand side. That patient needs to be sorted out ASAP. Uh, if we look at the image on the right hand side, um, this is a massive effusion that's actually pushing the lung, the pushing the trachea as well. It's not as marked as the other one, but there is some tracheal deviation on there. If you've got a tumour that's really like sticky and pulling everything on, like a pleural tumour or a, a lung tumour with pleural uh, attachments and it pulls towards the, towards the pleura, that can pull the trachea towards it as well. So it's just looking if it's nice and central, brilliant, and if it's not, why? Look at the breathing. So we look at the lung tissue. You divide the lungs into three. So we divide, so there's the left upper, oh, flipping it, sorry, the left upper, the right upper, the mid zones, and the lower zones, okay? There are different numbers of ribs and stuff, but to be honest with you, no one ever sticks to them because if you've got someone who's not been reading properly or someone who's had surgery, doesn't matter, we do it into zones. I literally compare like for like. I look, sometimes you can look at a film and go, oh, that's normal. And then actually look at it a second time and you go, no, there is something there because if you literally split the chest into six, so three right, three left, and you compare like for like, quite often you will see something on one side. So that's what I do. And I also look for my vascular markings. So I've, I've been a bit naughty with this film actually, I just really liked it. So I wanted to show you the, the, the bronchi. So this is a film, this is called a bronchogram and it's happened by accident. So this has happened because someone's had a barium swallow for um, esophageal problems and they have inhaled barium. So that is actually oral contrast inside the lungs, but it, it's a beautiful picture. But unfortunately, the patients get really sick. They get really, really sick. So yeah, um, just thought it was a great picture. Wanted to share it. You can never see them, it's really bad. So yeah, so we compare both sides. We look at the, then we look at the, the lung markings. So we wanna make sure there's no pneumothorax. Now, some pneumothoraces can be so subtle. It is unbelievable. They are so subtle. Air rises, so they usually sit in the apices, hence why it's one of our review areas. And if you look at the apices of the lungs, there's a top here. You've got rib one coming down, rib two, rib three. It's very crowded up there, very crowded. If you've got a tiny little slither of air in that pleura, it's going to be really hard to see. You also get a lot of them. Um, uh, pleural scarring and pleural plaques up here, so pleural calcification. So you get more basically white, <laughs> more white up here. So how we check the pneumothorax is we look at the pulmonary vascular markings. So you, you can, this one is not a great example, but you can see the same densities. On most heck, you can actually follow them, follow the little lines right to the edge of the lungs. And if you've got a pneumothorax, it's usually going to be up here or it's going to be huge and then it's usually quite obvious as well. Remember, if you've got an x-ray from a patient who's lying down, the air won't go to the APCs. The air will stay at the, they'll kind of rise to the top of the chest. So they, they, they're very difficult to interpret. We often do a lateral chest x-ray as well. So we glass them from the side as well. So we can just see two, two planes basically and compare. Oh, that's not projected well at all, has it? Oh, how awful. Basically, this lung is meant to look like a dalmatian. Um, so not only are we looking for um, no pneumothoraces, we are, and the actual lungs look, look healthy. Um, sometimes, I'll just show you, you can't really see it on here. Sometimes you see little, little like circles almost, little tiny little, little like slightly, slightly more black than the rest of the lungs. And that's usually down to emphysema. So 
chronic smoking obviously causes emphysema, lung damage, parenchymal lung damage, which looks like chronic lung changes on x-ray. Uh, I'm so sorry this has come out horribly, but basically this is a chest x-ray that is absolutely full of little rounded, little rounded um, uh, areas of high density compared to the lung tissue itself. So I look, remember back to our initial slide and what colour was what, I'd be very worried this is soft tissue. I'd be very worried that this is a horrible, nasty process going on. Now, if anyone can tell me what these are called, I'll be very impressed. But maybe if Wendy sees anything, she can let me know. But if anyone knows what this is called, fair play. So these are multiple metastases and they're very rounded. So rounded multiple lung metastases from a, from, from a different cancer. Anyone can tell me, I'll be very impressed. Okay, so let's look at this, this x-ray. If anyone wants to write in the chat box what they think's going on here. So I'm going to start by splitting the chest into six. Three on the right, three on the left. I'm going to compare the upper zones, the middle zones, and the lower zones. And I am very drawn to this area here. And I think in this area, compared to this area, there's increased density. That's how we describe things on x ray density, okay? So that, I think, is a low bar consolidation. If you look carefully, you can see here, the tiny little circles, and here, the tiny, tiny, tiny circles, they are what we call air bronchogram. So it's air within consolidation. Now remember, consolidation is like pus and just gunk inside the lungs themselves. So when you've got the bronchus coming in and little airways, this is all air and little airways, okay? Um, so yeah, this is this is this is a this is a right middle zone consolidation. Okay. So yeah, just look at the, how, how bright it is compared to the other side. I'll just show you on this x-ray, it's quite nice. You can see here all these little tiny little little lines, little linear densities. These are all the pulmonary vessels and the pulmonary vasculature. Um, and they go right to the edge of the lungs. They go right to the edge. This is a scapula. Be careful of the scapula that can patch you out. This is the, so this is the scapular blade here. There's no pneumothorax. They go right to the top. Okay. What about this film? If anyone can tell me what the thing's going on here. It's a left side of pathology, I'll tell you that. So we divide the lungs, one, two, three. My eyes are being drawn to the left. Because this looks very, very more dense compared to this. And this looks more dense compared to this. The left, the bottom's not too bad actually. Then I look at my lung markings, so I'm trying to trace them right to the edge of the film on the right, on the right, right hand side. Do, 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 do. Oh, they're all lovely, right to the edge. Then we go to the left hand side, try and trace the pulmonary vasculature. It all looks very squished, doesn't it? It doesn't look right. There's no nice lines. And then, oh, we stop. This is a, this is a very big left side of pneumothorax. It's not a tension. Remember, attention in pneumothorax is when the air goes in and can't get out. It's usually like a penetrating injury, like a or like, um, like a blunt trauma, like a valve, like a one-way valve. The air can't get out. If the air can't get out, it'll just push, 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 push. And then you get reduced venous return and then base level cardiac arrest if you don't decompress it quickly. This is not. This is a, um, a, not, like a normal pneumothorax. Um, so yeah, so the reason this is all very congested looking is because the lungs are literally squished. That's a pneumothorax. So this one, the exposure is not brilliant because it's, it's quite bright. It makes me kind of go wool. Um, on our workstations, when we're reporting x-rays, we can actually change the exposure factors, which is quite nice. We can change the windows. We can make them darker. So we can help ourselves really. It's cheating, isn't it? But if it's there, I'll do it. Um, so I'm going to, like I say, split the chest, two, three, 
left hand, the right hand side doesn't look too bad actually. This is a bit bulky, this hilum, but I don't think it's too bad. Then we're going to look at this side. We're going to look at the, the left hand side now. Upper zone is okay. You might, you might, your eye might catch these quite a lot at the top of the lungs, both sides. These, this is this is the costochondral junction. They can be quite calcified, they can look very horrible, like sort of like cancer. You've got to get your eye into that because unfortunately most of them do. A lot of old people's x-rays do look a bit funky up here. I'm checking the middle zones. My eyes drawn to that. What is that? So that is, well, it's a solitary lung lesion by the looks of it. It's very rounded in nature. It's hyper, it's um, increased density compared to, the, compared to the lung. And then I see this here. So these are, these are quite bright, aren't they? Compared to the, so compared to the bones, these are these are very bright. So remember looking back to our um, colour chart at the beginning, this is a metallic foreign body. So this is going to be a surgical suture, at a clip, sorry, or a staple of the fall. I'm not, I'm no surgeon. Um, this patient's clearly had some surgery here, and I think this is a resulting metastases or resulting new tumour or regrowth. Okay. This is the fissure you can see along here. Remember, the right side of the lung has two fissures, the left side has one fissure. You sometimes see an extra fissure in the right. It's called the exigus fissure with an extra lobe. It's a normal variant. We don't care about it. We don't even report them anymore. Um, yeah. So this is this, uh, this is soft tissue density, and this is probably a tumour. This would need a CT scan. Anything that's, anything that's not consolidation, anything that you think is a bit weird, suggests, oh, I think they should have had further imaging. Have they had a CT scan? We might whip up a scan for you, which just makes life a lot easier. I can't remember what these are now, so I'll put them together a while ago. Okay. Now, if anyone can tell me what this is, again, very impressed. So we'll look at the, we'll split the lungs again, top, middle, bottom, top. Looks fine. This is this funky first rib again, but yeah, you learn to just miss them. Middle zones look okay. This is emphysema down here. Remember we said about emphysema and chronic lung changes and destruction of the lung tissue, that's that. Then we look at the bottom. So we look at the lungs that look too bad. This, this side looks very small compared to this side. I know your heart's in the way, but even so, it looks small to me. The left hemithorax has got the volume loss, okay? Then we look at the heart shadow. The heart shadow looks, looks okay. Um, I've, I've, I've cut out. I've cut out the AP and PA. Sorry, this is this is this is an AP. Uh, the PA, sorry. So it's it. Yeah, the heart size is okay. Um, what's this here? This is very high dense, isn't it? This is very very high dense. It's almost looks metallic. It's not. But it looks metallic. This is. Has anyone commented, Wendy, what this is by any chance? Just shake your head or thumbs up or whatever. Uh, no, someone just mentioned cardiomegaly, possibly. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, I, to be honest, I don't think there is cardiomegaly because they're very rotated. So here's the medial clavicle and there's the medial clavicle. So they're not quite, they're not quite centre. And you can see the spinous process are going off this way rather than down the middle. So I think th they might have an element of it, but it's certainly not marked cardiomegaly. It's this here that I don't like. That is what we call the sail sign. So like a sail in a yacht or a boat, sailboat, whatever. Um, and that is a left lower lobe collapse. So you get two heart borders. So it looks like the heart, doesn't it? It looks like the heart. And then you get the heart and you're like, hang on a minute, you haven't got two hearts. As the Grinch got two hearts, can't remember. Um, but yeah, so basically that is the sail sign. So that is a left lower lobe collapse. Any collapses, unless they're an asthmatic and they frequently collapse and have loads of like secretions and stuff, they have to have a CT. So it's usually an obstructing bronchial lesion causing that. Okay. So yeah, that's a sale sign. Um, again, another one. This is an AP film, the heart's massive. So you can't quite tell how big it is, it's just, it's just huge. Um tops, fine. Middles, fine. Bottom. Where is the bottom of the left of the right? Where is the right lung? Where's it gone? Um, so then we look at our angles. Now, unfortunately, I've chopped it off, but 
the angle on this one, the angle to the diaphragm and the ribs, spot on. There's nothing there. As it is spot on. You have to trust me. I'll show you later on. Uh, this is not spot on. So let's look. Look how high the left right hemi diaphragm is. It shouldn't be high. It should be lower than the left. No, higher than the right, higher than the left, but it shouldn't be that high. And if you look, it should, the diaphragm should go down here. This is very high density stuff down here. And it's kind of sweeping upwards. So you're losing that nice downward angle. It's going up again. What's that all about? So that is what we call meniscus, like a fluid level. So that is a, that's a good going right side of diffusion. Okay, so very high density they tend to be. They tend to, and sometimes you see them right to the top of the lungs, and it's called a whiteout because it's so white. Okay, this is a bit more tricky. This is, a, this is a, you know, if you can pick this one up, have my job. Um, I've chopped off the left hand side because it's basically irrelevant. You should see this is the abnormality. So your eyes should be into the drawn. That is not right. Right upper zone. Look at the look at the difference between the left hemithorax and the right hemithorax. You should always see more right hemithorax than left because there's no heart on the right unless we get extra cardiac person, which they did put in my finals, which really confused me. But hey, um, this is a right upper zone collapse. So volume loss, and there's an S shape. Can you make that out? It's a backwards S. So from the top of the, of the aerated lung, down to the hilum, into the middle of the chest, so into the mediastinum. So that's called what we call the golden S. Now that is cancer. That is, a, that is an obstructing right-sided and bronchial lesion. I've never ever seen it not be a cancer, okay? So that needs CT scan, lung referral, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's bad, that's bad. That's, yeah. They're quite cool though. If you do see them, they're quite not for the patient, but for us. This is a trickier one. So we'll go on to this in a minute, but we don't, you know, lungs are really important, of course they are. But, you know, most clinicians can tell you, oh, there's a pneumothorax, if it's big enough, you know. Most people can have a good go at an x-ray. It's my job to tell you the things that you're not gonna see, um, if I can. <laughs> So let's look at the, so your eyes should instantly be drawn to the left upper zone. Just something not right going on here. I hope you agree. So the apex is, I'll go for the review areas, but apex is very important for the review area because like I say, it's quite crowded. And there's a type of tumor grows in the apex of the lungs and it can cause all sorts of weird and wonderful symptoms, including recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, and it can make you hoarse. So I know that's called, but in the comments, um, the common exam question actually. So do, you know, we must remember that one. So we're looking at the lungs, So we know there's something going on up here. I don't like that at all. Look at the density of this one compared to this one. This has got soft tissue density up here. I don't like that. I think there's gonna be a malignancy up here. Then we're going to look at the middle zones, they're fine. The lower zones are fine. There's a bit of blunting of this angle here. So look at the right, lovely, crisp, a nice, almost like a, like a, like a Nike side, almost. Um, you're not getting that on this side. There's, quite, there's that swoop again, isn't there? So I think there's an effusion on that left-hand side. Along with this is now making me think, hang on, there's a malignancy here. There's a malignant effusion with a, with a soft tissue density. Look at the clavicles. Look at the right clavicle. Beautiful, beautiful uh, right angle of mount flipping uh, clavicle with the manubrium. Where is the left distal clavicle? Unknown. That has been eroded away by a tumor. The tumor has actually eroded that bone away. So this person is in trouble. Not only have they got a primary malignancy, also if you look at the ribs, look at that first rib completely eroded. They've eroded through the first, second and third anterior ribs. Not good. This person's in trouble. They've got a, they've possibly even gone in, have they gone into the spine, the transverse process of the spine? Probably not. Um, but yeah, they're in trouble, aren't they? They've got a malignant diffusion, they've got soft tissue density and they've got bony destruction. They're going to be in trouble. 
And let's look at this AP window. So you've got aorta, pulmonary vasculature. This should be completely empty. Something in there. We've got massive lymphadenopathy as well. So this pay, this person's in big trouble. So this is the thing. Don't, I love this picture. Don't forget about the bones. They are there. They are difficult to interpret. I agree. Don't forget them. It's really hard to see what's not there. That sounds so stupid. You look at something, you go, yeah, it's normal, cool. You look at something and it's not there. I reported the scan and a CT scan the other day on the call. And I, I, I sent it off to the clinicians and I thought, oh, I'll just double check some things. I couldn't remember if I'd written there was a nodule or something. And I was like, where's the humerus gone? Like this guy had no humerus because they're, they're like this in the scanner. And the, 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 right, the left humerus was fine. And the, the right humerus, it's gone. I was like, where's it gone? And I rung A&E, who referred him, and I said, is the guy broken his arm? And they were like, no. And I said, just x-ray it. And he had completely snapped his arm in half because of the, because the, the distal angle was so far away. It was gone. Um, so it was a good job, I checked it. So you don't know what's not there, so you always have to check your bones quite carefully. Remember, with bone disease, we're looking for lack of bone, like the last one, it's gone. We're looking for fractures, we're looking for old fractures. Fractures on a chest x-ray are extremely difficult to see unless the bones are literally like hanging off, you know, they're so displaced. Um, look for sclerosis as well. You know, you've got your prostatic cancer and you get sclerosis. So very bright bits of bones, not normal. Always compare it to the rest of the bone, bones, basically. And look for things like fractures, like of the humerus. Look for lytic lesions. Look for areas of low density in the bone. Quite common again. Um, it's common, a patient comes in to see a GP with a chronic cough and we find a, a primary bone tumour in the lungs all, all the time. Uh, this, uh, you should, they, they're never this obvious, but this is a nice anterior rib fracture. One, two, they've knocked off three anterior ribs, they've probably got the posterior ribs as well. That's a big trauma, that. And if you look down here, you've lost that nice costophrenic angle again. It's all just blood and gunk down there, okay? So rib fractures. Um, cardiac, someone said, so someone said, cardiomegaly before. So a normal heart size is, should be, so from, you measure from here, the right ventricle to the left ventricle. And then you measure from each side of the chest wall. And the ratio of the cardiac to the thoracic should be less than 50%, okay? On our workstations, it does it for us, it's great. Most people go like that, and you go, that's the heart, that's the lungs, it's massive. Um, you can only measure this if it's in PA, remember. You often get a bit of high density down here. If the patient's quite fat, you get a big fat pericardial fat pad. So don't confuse it with um, uh, consolidation or anything. Look down here. Anyone know what these might be? And this. So I'm going to tell you, hands on, hands on my heart, no pun intended. I can never remember which valves they are. This is a this is a replacement valve. I have to go, I have to Google it every time. I can never remember which one's which on X-ray. Um, these are stenotomy wires. This patient's had open heart surgery, basically. So we know his heart's not ideal. Her heart, apologies. Her heart's not ideal. Um, she's had surgery. She's got an aortic valve, uh, probably an aortic valve, actually. Um, so we know she's probably going to have a big massive heart, isn't she? If you have a big, massive heart, we look for things like pulmonary edema. So I'll show you a picture of pulmonary edema, but we can look for bilateral effusions. That's got a, that's got a left side, a right side of the fusion, the left's okay. We also look for the upper lobe diversion. So where these vessels are here, sometimes they're very prominent. The lower ones should be more prominent than the upper ones. When the upper ones are more prominent, it's a sign of, sign of chronic heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. What am I trying to show you with this one? Oh yeah, massive heart. <laughs> um, you can just you eyeball it and you go, oh wow, yeah, it's massive, absolutely huge. So yeah, that's cardiomegaly. This is pulmonary edema. So this is, so yeah, I'm sure you've all seen x-rays of COVID. They're horrendous, aren't they? It's very patchy. It's patchy, what we call patchy infiltrates everywhere, but mainly in the periphery of the lungs. 
this is very central. Lots of increased density around the hilum, and it's very central, along with a huge heart, pulmonary edema, okay? Look at your diaphragms, the right choosing higher than the left, is that right yet? Yeah. Look out for air under the diaphragm. So air under the diaphragm on the mirror at chest x-ray is a perforation in the, in, in the abdomen until proof otherwise. It's always a perforation. Or post-surgery, you'll add it post-surgery. Check your claustrophrenic angles and your cardiophrenic angles as well for any effusion. Um, this is a perforation, so this is air under the diaphragm. Difficult on the left sometimes is the gastric bubble, so the, the, the stomach usually has air in it, so be a little bit careful. But on this left, on this right-hand side, there's a big, this, page, this patient's perforated the bowel probably. Very quickly, review areas. These are where things happen that we miss. Lung APCs, I bang my bath at loads. I have missed something in the lung APCs. Um, I missed the pneumothorax because there was just so much, no excuses there, but I did. So I bang on about it a lot now. Behind the heart, you can have consolidation, you can have tumours, you can have badness behind the heart, check there. Behind the diaphragms, difficult. You know, just give it a good look, really. Um, peripheries, we all forget the peripheries of the lung and you can get little pleural-based tumours, uh, like mesotheliomas and things. Look at the hilum. You have to get your you have to get your eye into the hilum. You, when you first start looking at X-rays or reporting them or telling people about them, you always say, "Oh, that hilum looks really really bulky." Probably isn't. Um, it's like people say, "We need your hilum's really widened." I would personally say, genuinely now, because I've been told this a few times in my previous years. If you're not a radiologist, do not comment on the medius hilum because it's so variable. You can have someone who's completely normal, a really skinny person, have a massive medius hilum. Very variable, so just don't mention it because you get yourself into trouble. And they'll start asking things about, oh, what does it mean? You're like, oh my God, I don't know. Uh, behind the breast shadows. When they've got breast implants, very difficult. So quickly look at a few of these, just because it's just to show you the review areas, really. Um, if I can remember what they are myself. <laughs> um, I think I can see it, I think. So this is a P, you know, this is AP film. Look how much the scapulas are in the way. They're basically covering half the lungs, aren't they? It's not ideal. They're not breathing that much. Look at this. So that's the left heart, isn't it? That's the left heart border. You should be able to see the diaphragm the whole way through the left heart border. There's something behind that heart. It's either infection or it's a tumour. We need to really like, you know, you ask the clinicians what do you think is going on, what are the inflammatory markers doing, blah, blah, blah. So that's that. Um, oh, this. Now this, this is, um, what is that actually? That's probably some tubing of some description for probably some oxygen that's been like chilling on her abdomen rather than in her nose where it should be. This here is a look at the apices. Now, can you can you make out that there's little tiny vessels up here? Whereas this, there's no vessels. Can you see this line here? This is the this is the, the lung border. So this is an pneumothorax, and there's honestly they can be so much more subtle than that. What is this? I can't remember. Um, this is an awful picture. Um, what have I said this is? Oh yeah, look at the hilum compared to this hilum. Granted, they are rotated, I agree, but look how bulky that is. That's not right. That's not right at all. That's probably massive, um, me, that's lymphadenopathy. So there's, there's something going on up there. This is similar to the one I showed you earlier. So what I told you about earlier, you know, with the, all the really bad picture looked awful and there's loads of um, spots, sort of like a Dalmatian. They're cannonball metastases and they are from renal cell carcinoma. Dead common exam question. There's the primary tumour there and there's multiple soft tissue nodules everywhere bilaterally there, 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 there. There's one just here. Can you see that? So this is under the diaphragm, behind the heart. So it's a, and there's one here as well. This is what I mean about behind the diaphragm is one there. Yeah, that, that might be your own, that might be your own lesion. And if you miss it, the patient's going to go home and they're fine. The next one's going to come back like this, aren't they? Full of attack, full of cancer. That's it, everyone. That's all I've got for you. Um, any questions?
amazing references, or not abdominals, should be chest. <laughs> Any questions at all? Any questions, Wendy? Uh, not so far, but I think usually legs. So I'll let you know. Okay, cool. I found that a bit useful. There's one so far. It says Hi. the slide with the left sided pneumothorax. What was happening at the lower zone of the right thumb? Let's see. <laughs> Lower zone of the right lung down here. Um, probably, to be fair, probably a little bit of uh, what we call atelectasis. So you can't quite tell um, the left because the heart's in the way. You, you can still see the diaphragm. You can't quite tell what's going on here. I agree, it's a bit, bit, a bit fluffy down there. You'll often see reports saying there was atelectasis. Atelectasis is basically a bit of like lung tissue rather than being aerated or squished. So it looks a little bit like there's a little line or was it fluffy? Uh, if, if it's not consolidation, I don't think that's consolidation. It's not, it's not quite discreet enough for consolidation. It's a very odd place for it to be. If it's going to be consolidation, it's usually going to be uh, low bar. I meant to tell you actually, um, they love it when we tell them where the consolidation is, if it's just kind of patchy, stuff like, like COVID, you can't really tell, it's everywhere. Um, if something is obscuring that this, this right heart border, so if you've got uh, like this here, this little fluffy bit, if you've got this up here, if it's, uh, just remember, if it's obscuring the right heart border, it's in the right middle zone, no right middle lobe. Okay, remember that, for example. If it's obscuring the left heart border, it's probably in the lingula. So the little extra bit that flaps up top of the, the left lung. Uh, sorry, um, somebody mentioned that it wasn't that particular slide. I think it's earlier one. Pneumothorax. Let me see. Pneumothorax is a Is that one the move? No, it's just lung collapse. This one here. Yeah. What's going on down here is absolutely nothing. It's the breast. Here's the breast. This is what I mean. You see about a 2D image of a 3D person. Um, so they're quite skinny, which helps, but they've got quite dense breasts that you can't really see on the left hand side because the pneumothorax has ruined everything. But if you look on this right side here, look at the breast tissue. This this is actually breast tissue. But again, it's superimposed. This is normal lung underneath it. And uh, this is normal distal lung. So if you remember, um, I, all, I always think of the lung anatomy, the zones and the different like the different lobes on, a, on like, a, like, like a sagittal view. So through the center lobe this way, um, because the lower lobe actually goes really far, far back. And um, there's no point listening when you're examining clinically the, the, the lower lung like the, the, the right and the left lower lobes anteriorly. You're not going to hear it. You have to listen to the back. You're not going to hear bivasal preps. You're not going to hear it at the front because it's not the base. Um, so that is actually just normal aerated lung here. It's just because the breast is used by dense. Um, somebody's asked, is there any difference between x-ray appearance of consolidation and lung infiltrates? It is interchangeable. So lung infiltrates is usually like infiltrative change. Some people say consolidation because consolidation is pneumonia, isn't it? So um, you can't diagnose pneumonia. It's a radiological diagnosis. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a low respiratory tract infection with x-ray changes. Lung infiltrates tend to be things like you can have infiltrative changes. You can have like... Um, things like eosinophilia, that's quite infiltrative. That's usually, I don't know if you remember my, from doing the, the secondary pulmonary lobule. Do you guys remember that? Because when you have like the hexagonal um, lung, like they do it like per cell. So you have like the hexagonal area and you've got your, your bronchi, your vessels, and then in between each, like each, hexagonal bit which is your alveoli essentially 
that's where your infiltrates live. So that's why we get air bronchogram, because we get all crap inside the lungs, like gunk and, you know, you have a phlegm, and yeah. um, you get all that in those spaces. And that's why it looks so thick. Um, but you get the air through it. And um, so consolidation and infiltration. Some people don't quite want to call consolidation if it's not that dense. Um, if it's just a little bit patchy, you're not quite sure you call it a build. It's a bit like sitting on the fence. You don't want to, you don't want to call it pneumonia because it's not that bad, but it's definitely something there. One more question. Um, how can you precisely differentiate between consolidation and effusion on chest x-ray besides the meniscus? Um, the density, so it's usually, it's usually more dense if it's an effusion. If it's an effusion, it's 99% or 90% of the time going to be the bottom of the lungs. Um, so you're going to lose your cross angles. However, it could be a loculated effusion or an empyema. Now that's, that can be, you can have an effusion that can go like up here. I have one the other day and it kind of went up here. And then here, and then here, and then here, it looked really odd. Um, so it almost looked like like some sort of mesothelioma, like, like a plural um, soft tissue thing. It was very odd. Um, but that could be a loculated one. Consolidation is all about air bronchogram. So it's all, I wonder if I'm going to die. So, yeah. So, uh, right, where's that fusion one? Uh, if you look here, right, this is consolidation. This is really dense, hitting you in the face. It's in a low bar distribution. You cannot see that right heart board. You see the bottom of it, but you can't quite see it. That is right middle low consolidation. If you look, you can't really see. This is the problem with x-rays. They're not good. You can't really see the the the, the right um, main bronchus. You can see the airway is here and here. And you can follow, if you look really closely, you can follow the airways right the way to the periphery. So there's crap in the lungs, but it's not in the bronchus, it's in the lung parenchyma, it's in the interstitial of the lung. Um, so we get air bronchogram, so it's air within us, within the lungs. So it's all that air bronchogram, you don't get that with effusion. Because the fusion is in the plural space, or in the potential space that is now the plural space. That's just fluid in the wrong place. Okay. Uh, another question: How would uh -huh. you know if a an atelectasis is caused by airway obstruction or pneumothorax? Atelectasis is usually secondary to squishing of some description or scarring so if you've had a nasty chest infection with a bit of consolidation usually in the lower lobes you'll get like a little ah, you'll get like a little line of, of like a like a little band of white and um, it's usually secondary to previous infection it could be down to so sometimes if you've got an effusion and where the effusion is it's actually pushed some of the lung tissue together so it's bunched it up a bit that can that can cause that can cause an atelectasis um post-surgery they get atelectasis quite often they're not breathing properly and if they're in pain or they've got a laparotomy and they're in pain they're not breathing properly so they're not expanding their lungs so they, they get squishing at the bottom um did i answer that properly <laughs> Um, there is another question. Um, mm -hmm. What is meant by particular nodular pattern? Uh, does that and infiltrates give the same appearance? Yeah, so particular nodular, I it's really difficult to show you because it's it, the image quality when I project it and then share it isn't great on Microsoft, but it's basically, so reticular is round and nodular, sorry, reticular is uh, like, like lines and nodular is like so like little like nodular circle things. 
So reticular nodular picture is usually an infiltrative disease. So it's not quite consolidation just yet. It's in the lung interstitium. And you get reticular nodular pattern with lots of different diseases. So like, um, I think cryptococcus disease or cryptococcus infection along with your reticular nodular shadowing. Um, like, it's just a certain descriptive term, really. And it's usually, usually used more in CT. So we can see more. So like the TB, for instance, there's a what we call tree in bud. And it literally looks like a tree and loads of little like, 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 like blossoms on the end. And that's a typical finding for TB infection in the lungs. So it's just, it's just like a way, it's like, it's like, a, like a descriptive term, really, for what is going on in the lungs. Um, but it's all usually a, in, a, like an infective thing. Sometimes you'll see, like here, look on this one, this here, and this, and this. See a very high dense compared to the rest, rounded thing. Now, we all in the past have called them uh, little tumours, little, little cancers, little nodules. They're actually just vessels coming towards you. And um, so just be, be careful. If there's no fog of them, they're all by the hilum, usually bilateral, and there's nothing else in the lungs. The lungs are completely clear otherwise. It's probably just a vessel. We've all overcalled those. We've all said, oh, easy CT. The CT comes back fine. <laughs> Oops. Just gonna give them a couple seconds more to see that they're not. Just while we give a few more seconds, just remember if anybody asks you for a to check a chest X-ray for NG feeding, if you're not sure, don't black it. It's something you can't black. You really can't black it. If they're not sure. You know, the, the, hey, who, who eats in the middle of the night? No one. You know, 99% of the time, the patient actually can wait or get a senior to have a little look or ring the radiology edge. You know, we, we don't mind. It's a 30 second job for us. Um, please don't wag it. Lots of hospitals now um, have like certain, have to do certain, like we had to do it even as well, just back to it last year. We had to do um, a course. Like, like a like a module and um, if you passed it you're allowed to just you're allowed to say so yes or no for feeding and if you didn't pass it you weren't allowed to, <laughs> allowed to interpret them it's fair enough really so please don't like it it's not worth your your license i don't think there's any questions so far but everyone cool everyone says thank you for the presentation it's really good no, um, you the QR code. I don't know if you want to pop that on your screen. Where is it? Uh, let me just stop sharing for a minute. Uh, and then let me have a, where is this QR code? Send it on the chat. Oh, QR code. Oh, no need for QR code. Okay. Good. Cool. Right okay. then, no more questions. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Really appreciate it. Hope it's hope it hope was useful at least. So at least take one thing or two things away from it. That's great. Thank Have you. It. Please fill in, please fill in the feedback forms.